Thank you, God. Well, Ken Fish is here to minister. We'd like to welcome him. Would you like to come up, Ken? Please stretch your hand out to Ken. Father, we just thank you for the ministry that is in him. We thank you for your hand of blessing that uh, comes to us through his words. We ask you to fill him with your presence and accomplish the things that you want to accomplish. We bless you, Ken, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Stephen. Hi, everybody. That was rousing. You know, if, if Jesus took the worship team, we're in trouble. All of us are in trouble. <laughs> Means the rapture happened. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Um, before we get going, I'm only going to wave one single piece of merch in front of you. Um, this is a five-disc uh, conference I did on the power of God. And uh, I have another two disc uh, set that I've had here before on the power of God, but that one's more what is it, this is more on how to move in it, why you need it, principles for releasing it in your life, etc. So you might be interested in this. It's very in theme with what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, just to remind you all, uh, Stephen sent me a text message which made it into my calendar that he wanted something like moving in power now on the street, in the community, and in our lives. So that's, that's what this is about. But um, tonight I'm not specifically talking about the power of God, although that's a great topic. I want to talk about uh, two of the gifts of power from 1 Corinthians 12. So I want to talk about uh, faith and miracles. This is different from healing. You know, we all love healing because pretty much everybody knows someone who's sick. might even be you yourself. Uh, I was in a meeting at Morningstar this week, and uh, you know, during the ministry time, somebody said, okay, everybody who's sick, stand up. And, or has pain in their body, stand up. And nearly everybody in the room stood up. In fact, I was sitting um, with some folks that were part of the leadership, and they all got up, and I kind of reflexively stood up, because, you know, when you're in a church service and everybody gets up, you know you're supposed to get up too. So I got up, and when I went, wait a minute, I don't, I'm not sick, and I don't have any pain in my body, so I sat down. But I, 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 like I said, I did it reflexively. So healing is a thing, and it's, a, it's an important thing, and I've taught on it here before at length, and in our school, we have some uh, curriculum on healing. We have some healing materials out on the table. Um, I might need healing of my memory, though, because I bought a, brought a bunch of MP3 cards with me on this trip, and they've sat in my hotel room the entire time, where they are not on the table for you good people to buy. Anyway, if you really want one, though, you could drive up to Baltimore tomorrow, where I'll be speaking at the vineyard called The Well, The Well Vineyard. Uh, in Millersville, Maryland, if you don't have other things to do for church tomorrow morning, that might be worth your drive. Um, <clears throat> but healing is, uh, healing is its own thing, and I'm into it, but that's not what I want to talk about tonight. What I do want to talk about is getting this frog out of my throat. So give me a moment. We need the gifts of faith and of miracles if we're going to do what Stephen said he wanted me to talk about, namely, to move in power now. We need these gifts because they are the surest way to demonstrate the manifest, overt power of God. I'm all for revelatory gifts. I'm all for prophetic ministry. I love all that stuff. But there's something about seeing things happen. I think it must have been about six or seven years ago, I came here for a winter conference, and David Ruhlman and Tracy were still uh, in the house, as they say these days. Uh, this was before they bugged out for Florida. Cowards. Anyway, uh, hi, David. How you doing out there? He always watches these whenever I'm here. Um, so 
I, I flew in and landed, and it was no big drama. And not long after I'd gotten to my hotel, kind of getting ready for the night meeting, David calls and he says, hey, uh, I don't know if you've been watching the news, but there's a snow hurricane supposed to hit D.C. And I was just right off of Highway 50 over here at the Hilton Garden Inn. And I said, really? And he says, yeah. And I said, huh. So I turned on the television while I'm talking to him, which is really rare for me. I don't turn on TVs much, ever. Um, and so I got to the Weather Channel, and sure enough, there was a snow hurricane, and it was kind of coming this way, coming up from the southeast, headed towards Washington. And it, I forget, it maybe was supposed to make landfall in roughly two hours. He says, yeah, they've already closed all the roads. The state of Virginia you know, says everything is shut. Maryland says everything's shut. The district's closing down, so we might as well just cancel the meetings, and we might as well uh, just you know, put out the word, and you can just take the weekend off. And I said, well, why don't we just rebuke the storm? And he goes, what? And I said, yeah, let's just rebuke the storm. Now, at that moment, I wouldn't have said it was an overwhelming and compelling gift of faith, but it was nevertheless a gift of faith. And... So David goes, yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. Let's do that. You know, we, we all fall into this. I'm not trying to throw him under the bus. I just, you know, at the moment, I was the guy who had the initiative for that. Other times, others have the initiative. But um, so, you know, we're on the phone together, and we just took authority over that storm and rebuked it. And we said, you know, Lord, you sent me here to do these meetings, so we just command this storm to turn around and head out to sea. And I'm telling you, I'm watching this on the TV with the Doppler radar, and this storm's headed just this way towards D.C., and all of a sudden it just turns, and it goes that way, and heads straight east out to sea. It never made landfall. Do you remember that? Yeah, and so not a, not a flake of snow fell, and people came to the meeting anyway, those you know brave souls who defied the government orders to stay home. Where have you heard that before? And... Uh, and the storm never came, and we had a great weekend, and, you know, bada boom, bada bing. But that's an example of how the gift of faith and miracles tandem together, and they provoke unusual outcomes. Now, I'm specifically talking about miracles. This could happen in the realm of healing as well, but I'm not talking about healing. I'm, I'm going after miracles right now. So... When we talk about the gifts of power, and I'm again talking at the moment about um, faith and miracles, all of these uh, gifts, they have to do with affecting God's hand versus God's mind or God's insight to a situation. And literally, these gifts of the Spirit will create acts of God. Now, they may not be on a scale of literally a hurricane turning. Uh, they may be low, you know, smaller, more localized. They could be localized to just whoever you're praying for in front of you or a situation in your own church, something with your city. But when these, when these gifts are in operation, the divine energy of God or the divine power of God accomplishes a particular result either through an action of an individual or the work of an, uh, excuse me, or the words of an individual. It could be either one. It could be from an action, or it could be from words. Now, a lot of you are looking at me like a cow looking at a new fence post. So that tells me this is not something you've heard a lot about before. And so some, for some of you that have been around me a while, you might have heard some of these concepts. But typically, when we see these, these gifts of power in operation, there's an interrelationship between them. And one of the most important things that goes with it is a certain kind of, I don't know what you want to say, boldness. And in our churches today, we don't really emphasize boldness very much. Some of our churches emphasize big-mouthedness or rashness or brashness. But boldness, God's boldness, is something altogether different. You know, it says... Uh, that when Peter and John were before the Sanhedrin, they took note of their boldness and they took note that they had been with Jesus. So there's something about being with Jesus that makes you a divine provocateur, if I can say it that way. And so what ends up happening is God moves through his vessels in powerful ways when these gifts are in operation. Now, when we talk about the gift of faith, it's one of the gifts that's mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And in this immediate context, we don't mean saving faith. 
There is something called saving faith. It's the faith by which you believe and are born again. And so it's, it's salvation that's in play there. There's also faith that's a body of truth. It's, it's Christian doctrine. We sometimes put a definite article in front of it and call it the faith or the Christian faith. I don't mean that one either. And then there's a third way that faith can be understood, which is really a loyalty. It's a, uh, it, it's a, it's a fruit of the Spirit, according to Galatians 5.22, and that means it can grow over time, and it has the understanding of being reliable, consistent, and dependable. Now, that, that fruit is a critical fruit. It's one that I might say many Christians could stand to grow in more. Um, and that kind of faith or faithfulness or fruitfulness is a key component in bringing the kingdom of God into reality. But the faith that I'm talking about right now is none of these. It's not saving faith. It's not a body of knowledge, nor is it faithfulness. In fact, sometimes people who are unfaithful can still be people of great faith in the sense of the gift. As an example, Samson. Right? Samson, we know a little bit about Samson. He had, we might say, a checkered reputation. And yet, when the chips were down, things happened around Samson, didn't they? In fact, at the very end of his life, having had his eyes gouged out because of his... Yeah, go for it. <laughs> at the very end of his life, having had his eyes gouged out because of his lack of faithfulness, because he'd been caught by the Philistines... He nevertheless asked to be led over to the, you know, the, the pillars of this house of Dagon. And then he, he calls upon God, leans with all his might, and down comes the roof. He dies in the, in the collapse as well. But it says he killed more in his last than he did through his whole life before that. But Samson, I don't think, I mean, praise God for the spirit of God moving through him. But I don't think anybody would hold up Samson as an example of how we want to live our lives. It's more of a counterexample or a contraexample from Scripture. But this gift that I'm talking about is it's the one that when Jesus says, if you have faith like a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be cast away into the sea and it will move. That's Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. He also says it again in uh, chapter 21, verse 21. And so it's a surge of faith. Now, I want to be clear here, though. If you've never experienced this gift or you don't move in it very much, it may not mean that all of a sudden you're like, oh, it's not that kind of, you know, braggadocious grandstanding. It's more of a quiet confidence that this needs to happen right now. Or maybe this is about to happen right now. That's a slightly different thing than it needs to happen. It's a sudden realization of what's going on in the moment and then... With that, you either undertake an action or you speak out a word, and that becomes the, the trigger point or the detonator of whatever it is that God has in mind. So, it's interesting. We get the word, uh, the word faith in Greek is the word pistis, P-I-S-T-I-S, -I -I pistis. And if you know anything about, um, you know anything about uh, flowers, horticulture, agronomy, if you know anything about these things, there is a part of a flower called a pistil, P-I-S-T-I-L. Same word except the last letter is switched from an S to an L. The pistil is the female part of a flower, and just like with men and women, the pistil receives the, the, uh, the seed or the, the pollen that's released from the male part of the flower, and so the implanted seed lands into the female part of the flower, and from that you get your fruit or your next round of flowers or you know, whatever. It depends on the particular plant you're talking about. But the gift of faith operates like this. It, we are the pistil, all of us. It doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. And the seed of faith... Sometimes the word for, in Greek, one of the words for it is sperma, which you, we know where we get that word. It implants something into you. And so there's an action of God. There's a divine, we could call it a swirl. I was using that term when talking about what's going on right now. And I think there was a lot of faith ignited in the room based on what we talked about this morning. 
But if we are the pistil, then there's this action of God where the Lord is moving, and when that seed drops upon you, again, whether you, whether you make it happen or see it happen, whether you undertake an action or speak it out, there's something in that that, that is triggered out of that gift of faith. And that's really the way it works. We are receptors. We are not the ones who uh, initiate this. And therefore, you can't work this gift up. Now, sometimes you'd be in meetings and people are like, come on, everybody, let's all stand up right now and let's just give a big shout. We're going to move the heart of God, everybody. Rah! And you get this kind of rally going. I mean, that can be exciting, and I'm not per se opposed to doing that, and it can be very invigorating, but that's not the gift of faith. In fact, oftentimes when there's a gift of faith in operation, instead, God has given you that understanding, so the the you know, the pollen of God has dropped into the pistil of you, and now something is germinating inside of you, and in that, there may actually be something that's more quiet than loud. It may be more subdued than demonstrative. What's an example of that? Well, you might remember that there's a scene in the book of Exodus. Moses has led the children of Israel out of Egypt, and they're supposed to go three days' journey into the wilderness, we could say ostensibly to worship God. It's not that I doubt they were supposed to worship God, but the three days into the wilderness just to worship God, God had a bigger agenda than that. So they're ostensibly going away to worship God, and having released them after the ten plagues and all that that entailed and all the wreckage that came on Egypt for that, now Pharaoh thinks the better of it, and so he musters his army, and he sends them after the children of Israel. And here they are. They're by the edge of the Red Sea. They've got an ocean in front of them, and they've got an army behind them. Both options are unacceptable. And so what does God say? Well, here it is. God says to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Stretch out the rod that is in your hand over the water, and I will part the water so that you may go through. And so Moses stretches out the rod, the same one that could turn into a snake. Now, why is he undertaking the action? He's undertaking the action of lifting the rod because the pollen of the word dropped into the pistil of his flower, and now he's effecting a miracle by the merger of the gift of faith, which comes by hearing. He heard the word of the Lord. And in this case, he undertakes an action and the water parts. But note this, most people miss it. It says, and God caused a wind to blow all day and all night so that in the morning the sea was dried up and they could pass through. That was a 12-hour miracle. One of the common misconceptions about miracles is they must all be instantaneous. Now, sometimes they are, and it's awesome when they are, but... You know, if you got the Egyptian army come closing in on you, I guess they probably had rear scouts or something who brought word of what's coming, and presumably it was less, you know, they were more than 12 hours away, 12 hours ride away, because all day and all night the wind had to blow in order for the children of it, and then they had to march across, and, and we've got 600,000 men, probably a comparable number of women, and all the children, so two and a half million people, how long does that take? So we don't... I mean, there, there's a little bit of time delay in all of that in crossing through the water. And note that the walls of water are on either side. This is what the Bible says. It's also what Charlton Heston's movie shows. And so they, you know, they get across the Red Sea, and Pharaoh comes in right behind them thinking, well, if they can do it, so can I. And then poof, everything closes in, and that's the end of Pharaoh's army. That's all in uh, the 14th chapter of Exodus. So faith is receptive to the implanted word, and it arises from receiving the word of God. Now note that, that it's similar to something Jesus said. Jesus said, I can only do what the Father shows me to do. I can only speak the words the Father gives me to speak. And so in this sense, the gift of faith is very similar to that general overriding concept of doing what the Father shows you to do. And so um, I mentioned this verse a moment ago. It's Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Now, Paul specifically is talking about evangelism there and people coming to, to belief and to sa saving faith. But, but there is a wider principle of how this gift of faith operates. 
And so that's kind of an archetypal verse uh, in terms of how we understand faith to function. But it's a template for how faith is activated in general and how the word of the Lord comes and is received. Now here's the thing. God is always speaking. Right? The scripture says, day to day the heavens pour forth the speech of God. And there is no voice or language where their voice is not heard. And so that's, uh, that's found in Psalm 19. And so... If you will, God is always speaking, but we aren't always listening. Or another way of saying it is, uh, you know, he's tuned to 101.5 FM, and we're tuned to 103.7. Both might be acceptable channels, but if you're on the wrong channel, you won't hear what he's saying. So a, a part of how the gift of faith functions is, it, it actually has a component to it like the prophetic consciousness, which sounds a little bit new agey, but... The prophetic consciousness is that consciousness that prophets walk in whereby they can hear the voice of God. They can discern what the Lord is doing in a room. They understand the times and seasons. They're, they're receiving something of the Lord that's there, but not everybody else hears it. By the way, if you want to know more about that specific piece of the prophetic, I've got a teaching on the table. I didn't bring it up here tonight, but it's called What is a Real Prophet? You might want to get that in You'll get more familiarized with that concept. But here's the thing. Jesus said this, my sheep hear my voice, a stranger they will not follow. It's a given if you are a child of God that you should be able to hear the voice of God. Now I know many say they don't, and it might be right that they don't, but if you're not hearing the voice of God, do you think that Jesus lied when he said my sheep hear my voice? No. So if you're not hearing the voice of God, is the problem on his end? So one of our problems is, and this is a huge problem, by the way. This, that pro the problem I'm about to describe for you is at least from the edge of this pulpit all the way over to here. It's at least that big of a problem. It may be bigger than that, but it's at least that big. And this is the problem. In the modern American church, we don't teach people to hear God's voice. We give them rules to follow in lieu of hearing God's voice. Sometimes we teach things that are contrary to the word of God, which is its own problem because things that are contrary to the word of God will breed unbelief, and unbelief is the antithesis of faith, and therefore, by teaching false doctrine, we are leading God's people into anti-faith, and we are shutting down the flow of the power that I'm describing. So false doctrine isn't just kind of a you know, bad idea, my idea against your idea. This is, this is actually, the, the teacher of false doctrine is literally an enemy of the people. Mic drop. So when we talk about hearing God and moving in this gift of faith, this concept, and especially so in the Old Testament, it's just not as emphasized as much in the New Testament. It's there, but it's more implicit. But in the Old Testament, it's quite clear. It leaves no room for not obeying, which is the same thing as saying acting upon that, just, that which is received by God or from God. It leaves no room for acting upon that which is received from God. Now, if you're not in the habit of living this way, you are going to stumble and make some mistakes. You will stub your toe at the beginning. You will feel like a fool, and you will make mistakes. Everyone does. So, you know, just join the club. We're all in the, you know, I blew it club somewhere, or I missed it, or whatever. But eventually, here's the thing, the more you do something, especially doing it right, <laughs> practice. A practice makes perfect, but perfect practice is what really makes perfect. And so as you begin to do these things and you winnow out the stuff, you go, well, that didn't work. So I thought that was the voice of God, but apparently not. You get to a place eventually, some sooner than others, but eventually you get to the place where you're starting to lock on to what God is saying and you start to get a higher hit rate, if you want to say it that way. So John Ruthven, in a book called What's Wrong with Protestant Theology, 
John Ruthven was a, uh, he's retired now, but he was a professor of systematic theology at um, Regent University. And John Ruthven said this in the book, What's Wrong with Protestant Theology. By the way, that book is, as you might guess, what's wrong with Protestant theology. And so he kind of takes on a lot of the big bugbears that are, that are amiss with the way we do Christianity within the Protestant church in the West. It's a great book, but I will warn you, it's dense. So unless you're up for a you know, serious read that's going to take you a number of hours to get through, I don't recommend it just to everybody because your head will explode. But anyway, here's a quote from John Ruthven. Faith is heeding God's immediate voice. Because faith is, a good synonym for the word faith is confidence. Faith is not, I'm trying to faith into it, I'm trying to believe. Sometimes people say, I wish I had your faith. And what they really mean by it is, I wish I could take things on blind trust the way you do. But we're not talking about making it up. We're talking about God spoke, and we have confidence in what God spoke. I touched on this concept last night when I was speaking about what happened with Nathaniel, and Philip says to Nathaniel, come and see. And there was apparently enough of a relationship there, and again, it's a different sort of a society from the way we live in the West, where if a good friend tells you, you're going to like this, just, take, just trust me on this, you say, okay, I'll trust you. That's not our go-to response, even with good friends, sometimes not even with our husband and wife maybe especially with our husband and wife, in Western society. This is one of the things that's broken in our culture. You know, all cultures are fallen in their own way. You know, American mainstream culture is not more righteous than, I don't know, Nigerian or DRC or Chinese culture. It's just wrong in different ways from the way they're wrong, and we assume that we're right. That's kind of the nature of the egocentric you know, capacity of mankind. We always assume that our position is right and everybody else is wrong. So in the West, that's kind of how we operate. And so we, we really struggle to take it that if somebody tells us something, they'll actually back us up. And we see over and over again, by the way, in the Bible, that when God speaks to people, oftentimes they struggle with that too, even when they know it's God. Right? Think of Gideon. The angel of the Lord appears to him and he goes, Hail, mighty man of valor. And Gideon's like, who are you talking to? And he knows this is an unusual thing. He's not even totally sure who it is. And so he says, let me go and, you know, get, get an offering. So he goes and brings some unleavened bread, and he puts it on the rock, and the angel of the Lord reaches out with his staff, touches it, and flames spring up from the rock. Well, that would get your attention. And then he watches the angel ascend in the flame. So I don't know, is this like so big of a flame that the angel gets engulfed? Or does the angel spring into the fire? I don't know how that happens, but the point is he sees that and he goes, Ah, I'm going to die, I saw God! But the Lord says, no, that's actually not going to happen. Go in the strength you have. And he's like, well, how can I do that? Because I'm just Gideon and, you know, my family is not a noble family. I'm, I'm a nobody from nowhere. And you're telling me I'm supposed to go rescue the people of Israel. Moses had the same problem. The Lord appears to Moses. He says, you know, I want you to go down to Egypt and I want you to rescue my people. And Moses is like, uh, I don't speak very well. Could you send Aaron instead? The Lord goes, well, okay, I'll, I'm not going to heal your speech impediment. I don't know why, but okay, I'm not going to heal your speech impediment. Aaron can go and be your spokesman. He's like, well, how about we just not do this? And God says, listen, you're going to go to who I tell you to go to and you're going to say what I told you to say. So knock it off. So Moses is trying to get out. So there's something about us that intrinsically moves away from that. But the point is, if we're going to please God, the scripture says of the gift of faith, now this is more of the, of the faithfulness kind of faith or saving faith, but it also applies to the gift of faith. Without it, it is impossible to please God. And so there's something about the gift of faith where, we, we, where we've somehow overcome that natural reticence, hesitation, unbelief, whatever term we're going to call it, where we move beyond that and rise to the moment that God himself has triggered, and we say, oh, this, this looks crazy, but I'm going to do it anyway, and suddenly, boom, things happen. God is pleased by that, and I'll tell you why. He's pleased by it because when that happens, 
there's no way you're going to take credit for it. You're going to be the guy saying, I was in total unbelief. I didn't think this was going to happen at all. And I'm looking at my friend Brad over there. He came out from Indiana. He and I were praying for someone this afternoon. And we got to this point, and I, I had this sense from the Lord. I, I will stop short of calling it a word from the Lord, but it was more than nearly a hunch. It was somewhere in that mid-zone. And I was like, Damn, I don't want to talk about this. This is awkward and weird and hard and the context in which we were, I don't want to go into all of that, but the, that context, it was not an easy place to bring up what I needed to bring up. So I kind of hemmed and hawed and waited and sort of, I did that for about eight or ten minutes, which is a long time. And, uh, you know, finally, I don't know, the, the person we were praying with kind of asked a question. I was like, well... I didn't really want to go here, but you know, I, I just got a funny feeling that maybe this might be the thing. And so it was a little bit awkward. It wasn't as bad as I thought it would be, but it was, it was awkward enough. So I, anyway, we went for that, and what do you know? It was the thing. And, and that's often the way it happens with the gift of faith. So that faith that we get, this is why it's a gift. Because it doesn't arise out of you. It's something, it's an unction, it's a grace of the Holy Spirit moving through us. And so in that, we heed God's immediate voice after eight or ten minutes, which is sort of immediate. That's meant to be funny. Now, if you think I'm making too much of that point, let me just show you something from the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus is a great book to study for examples of faith. But in Exodus chapter 20, they've gotten the Ten Commandments, and Moses had been invited up on the mountain. And the, the preamble for Exodus 20 is this. It says, now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke or wreathed in smoke. This is Exodus 19, 18. Because the Lord had descended upon it in fire. And the smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln. And the whole mountain trembled greatly. See the earthquake there, by the way, speaking of this morning's message? Visitations of God and earthquakes. So the mountain. And by the way, in Hebrew, it's a continuous rolling. So, you know, you think a 10-second earthquake is bad news. Just imagine, like, you know, two or three hours of that. A day. And the mountain's burning and the smoke is rising. It's like Krakatoa east of Java all over again or something. And so the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder and louder. And Moses spoke and God answered him with thunder. And the Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain. And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. Now, prior to this, the Lord had invited the people to come up with Moses, and the people of God had said, oh, no, 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 we don't want to go up there. You do it, Moses. Come back and tell us what God had said. And so you see in that, that, that reticence, that hesitation, and with that show of fireworks, I would probably be hesitant too. So now that this is happening, the Lord says to Moses, go down and warn the people lest they break through unto the Lord to look and many of them perish. They want to look at God. And let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves lest the Lord break out against them. And so the Lord said to him, go down and come up again bringing Aaron with you. And so Moses does all of that. And here it is, verse 18 now of chapter 20. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid and trembled and they stood far off. God had called them to come near, but they stood far off. And they said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. This is the nature of an unbelieving soul. This thing of withdrawing from God, of running from him, 
is the thing that Adam and Eve did immediately after they'd sinned. They ran away from the voice of God when they heard him walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And so those who shrink back, the scripture says, my soul will take no pleasure in him. And so if you're going to operate in the gift of faith, one of the precursors to it is however you get there, whether it's inner healing or deliverance, whether it's contemplative prayer or more Bible reading, whether it's soaking prayer or getting baptized, however you do it, you've got to get to the place where you don't shrink back from the presence of God. That's like a necessary condition. You know, in logic, there's the formal language of logic. There's necessary conditions and there's sufficient conditions. Necessary conditions is you won't get there without this. Sufficient conditions are you can get there with this and only this. So I didn't say that it's the whole thing you need. It's not a sufficient condition, but it is a necessary condition. So when I'm talking about the gift of faith, and now we've been talking, as Stephen said, I want you to talk about power now in the marketplace, your community, wherever you may be. Part of what you've got to do is you've got to be in that place with God where you actually are willing to lean into what he wants and you are confident that he will meet you in the leaning. And if you don't think that's available to you because, you know, that's only for, well, I don't know, I'm the guy in front right now, so I'll say Ken Fish. But I could say Chris Reed or Rick Joyner or Mike Bickle or John Wimber or Bill Johnson or Randy Clark. If you think it's only for them, you will never function in the gift of faith. And if you want to live in this dimension of power now, if you want to be able to live out what Jesus said, anyone who believes in me will do what I've been doing, and even greater things. The principles are the same. He heard what the Father said. He did what the Father showed him to do. You have to think that that could actually be your inheritance as well. And I say inheritance, I, I'm specifically not using the term confession. Because some of you come out of positive confession backgrounds. And so you're used to saying, I confess that. I don't want you confessing anything. I want you doing. I want you in action. You vote with your feet, not your mouth. And not only that, I, I, I want to say further to that, we're also not going to be decreeing, issuing apostolic decrees or pronouncements. And we are we are not going to claim it and stand on it. All of this is false faith. I think I just offended half the room. That half. Okay, this half's not offended. Okay, you guys are my friends. We're going to ignore them. Now, I am deliberately taking aim at some of the false teaching that's in the body right now, 2021. And the reason I'm taking aim at it is I want to release power through you to the world. And if you operate out of that other paradigm of all this blab it and grab it type stuff, you are not going to operate in the kind of faith dimension that I'm describing tonight. Does this make sense? Are we streaming this? I'm so I could get lynched after this. There might be a mob out there. Okay, pitchforks and tiki torches and all right. They're gathering right now. <laughs> Bless the Lord, brother. I'll agree with you on that. Shall we put our hands on the Bible as we claim it? <laughs> so the people drew back from hearing the word of the Lord. And this is the constant threat to the active dynamic release of power, and it's why religion is so deathly to the proper ex execution of faith. Now, I'm, I'm all for organized worship services. I have no problem with any of that. I think there's a place for liturgy, you know, structured Bible readings, taking communion, preaching of the word. I am not anti-church but I am sensitive to the fact that so often our rituals rob us of our connection to the voice of God. And we, we substitute those rituals for what God intends to release through us, and we never actually come to the place where we 
are intended to be. So what does it look like what God has as his intention for us? Isaiah chapter 59 says this, Isaiah 59 verse 21 as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. This is the covenant that God intended to make with the people of God. Now, he is speaking through Isaiah to Jews in this passage. But remember, what God gives to the Jews, he gives to anybody who gets engrafted into the Jewish tree, which is you, dear Christian, even if you're Goyesh, which is Yiddish for you're a Gentile. So you may not have one drop of Jewish blood in you, but if you have joined Christianity, by the way, I'm not preaching uh, Israelitism, nor am I teaching a Mosaic law, but the fact remains that Paul says everybody who's a Christian, even if you're Goy, you have been engrafted like a wild olive branch into the true vine stock of the, of the true olive tree. You are grafted in as a Jew. Christianity is a Jewish religion albeit without the Mosaic, you know, regulations. But you have been drawn into the place of God. So this promise that I'm about to read applies to you because you are a Jew by being grafted in. I'm just looking at my friends right here. All of you appear to be some form of Asian, Chinese, or Thai, or something, Japanese, Korean, okay? So here, but all of you, I don't care if you're Korean, you're Jewish. You look Hispanic. Are you Hispanic? No. What are you? You're black and white, mix, all right? So you're still a Jew, all right? So I could pick on some other people around here. You're German, but you're still a Jew. Nobody tell Adolf Hitler. I think he's already figured it out, <laughs> not to his pleasure either. Kind of hot down there. All right, so here we go, Isaiah 59. As for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord, my spirit that is upon you, Isaiah the prophet, and my words that I have put in your mouth, Isaiah the prophet, shall not depart out of your mouth or out of the mouth of your offspring or out of the mouth of your children's offspring, says the Lord, from this time forth and forevermore, God wants to put his spirit on you like he did on Isaiah. Now here's an interesting thing about Isaiah. He was a prophet and he was a worker of miracles. At one point, he delivers a word to King Hezekiah. You're going to die. Hezekiah turns his face to the wall and he prays. Oh God, I've served you from my youth. Don't let me go down to my grave in my years of youth. And so Isaiah is still walking out of the house. The word of the Lord comes to him. He had to be able to hear the word of the Lord. But the word of the Lord comes to him. Go back and tell Hezekiah, I will add 15 years to his life. Wow, okay. So he gives that word, Hezekiah recovers. In the midst of it all, he says, what will be the sign that this has happened? And Isaiah says, well, do you want the shadow from the sun to go forward or backward on the steps of Ahaz, which was one of the earlier kings? So it was a staircase that King Ahaz had built. Which one do you want? And he goes, well, it's easy for it to go forward. It always goes forward. That's when the sun goes from east to west, the shadow moves forward. He goes, make it go up the stairs, not down the stairs. What he's saying is make the sun go backward in the sky. He goes, done. And so the shadow went back 10 steps. Do you realize that this means, as we understand the universe right now, that the earth on its axis went, and it backed up. And then the orbital momentum began again in the middle of space, suspended in the universe. Can that really happen? Yeah, it can. Something akin to this had happened for Joshua in the Valley of Agilon during that battle. He held up his javelin and he said, sun stands still over Agilon and for 24 hours the sun stopped. Now think about how we understand the universe right now. You all know it. National Geographic puts it on their website and on TV all the time. And if you don't like it there, you can go find it in American, or what do you call it? Uh, Scientific American. You can look it up on CNN. But we understand that, you know, the Earth is kind of doing this as it goes around the sun. And what that means is that one entire rotation of the Earth 
just didn't happen. Or something like that. I mean, maybe God used another mechanism that we don't understand, but this is kind of a bit beyond, isn't it? Isn't it? So, Isaiah did it, and Joshua did it. In other words, it's not just a one-off thing. Here's another one, Isaiah chapter 30. It says in Isaiah chapter 30, uh, verse 20. I want to make sure I've got the, yeah, this is it. Isaiah chapter 30, And though the Lord give you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, yet your teacher will not hide himself anymore, but your eyes shall see your teacher. Boy, that's, that could be the whole message right there tonight. I could literally unpack that and preach a whole sermon out of it. I won't do it because sometime we've got to land the plane. But we got fuel yet, so we're not landing yet. But even in the midst of hardship and difficulty, even when the chips are down, even when life isn't going the way you want it to, yet your teacher will not hide himself from you anymore, and your eyes shall see your teacher. What did Jesus say? I only do what I see my Father doing. Who is your teacher? The Spirit of God. Because Jesus said, the Holy Spirit, he will be your teacher, and he will guide you into all the truth. So although this is an Old Testament passage, Jesus consciously uses this identical language in speaking to his very Jewish disciples because for sure they would have understood what that was referring to when they heard the teaching on the person of the Holy Spirit. And your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it, when you turn to the right or to the left. When you're about to veer off course, God will issue a mid-course correction through the person of the Holy Spirit, and this too will trigger great works of power through that gift of faith, which comes through hearing, which you will hear behind you. Now, will it be audible? Maybe. It may not be audible, though. Sometimes we communicate without words. In fact, Psalm 19 says, there is a voice that goes out into all the universe, and there are no words. Psalm 19. I think it's verse 3. There are no words. And so often people say, I have to hear God say, Mary Ann, Stephen, whatever that color is, orange red shirt, gray wrap. You may simply hear the voice of God with no words. Say, how do I do that? Well, any of you who are married and have a good marriage, bad one, this wouldn't work so well. You know what it is to just look at your spouse with, and you know you're both saying, did you hear that? Oh, that was really good. That was rich. Wow. Or, that guy's an idiot. Don't pay any attention to him. Sometimes it's just, you know, a roll of the eyes, or sometimes it's like that knowing glance. Are there any words exchanged? No. Not in that moment. But there is communication. And so there is a way that God can communicate to us that isn't merely language. Now, I'm all for audible voice of God. I'm all for if God speaks that way. I'm not in any way teaching against that expectation. I'm simply trying to broaden the opportunity set because so many times we get locked into a very narrow range in which we don't really... What we do is we limit God. And we limit God by unbelief, which insists that he speak to us in only that way that we have pre-designated. And that, too, will shut down the gift of faith that I'm talking about. Does that make sense? All right? Here's another one that speaks of how this works. Jeremiah chapter 31 Behold the day, I'm verse 31, Jeremiah 30, uh, do I have the right place here? Hold on. Yeah, Jeremiah 31, and as they say in the old-fashioned preaching community, and 31, 31 and 31. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Okay, that's you because you are engrafted into the house of Israel and of Judah because of this thing called the new birth. 
This is not like the covenant I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them. And by the way, don't th when you hear the word law, don't think rules and regulations. I mean, there are for sure rigid guidelines around some things in life. There's do's and don'ts. There's, you know, bright line tests of black and white for some things in life. But there are other things for which there is no bright line test. But God says, I will put my law, we might say my precepts or my principles, my guiding principles within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people, and thus they shall no longer uh, say each to one another, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. So you may say, back to something I said a few minutes ago, I'm no Bill Johnson, I'm no Randy Clark, I'm no John Wimber, I'm no fill in the blank with your favorite opt-out. This is from the least of them to the greatest. So even if you're a nose hair or a, you know, a hair in the ear or a whisker on the chinny chin chin and you think that's all you are in the body of Christ and you think you're the least among the body of Christ, this is still a promise for you. This is what triggers and activates that gift of faith. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. For from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. And then, of course, we have the famous prophet, uh, prophecy out of Joel, chapter 2, verse 28 and 29. God says, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Now, unless you aren't made of flesh, maybe you're made of material like that chair, but if your body is made of flesh, then you're included in the promise of Joel 2, 28 and 29. So faith begets faith, just as unbelief begets unbelief. And what I'm trying to do is show you that you indeed have the ability to receive from God and to respond to that. And the only reason you may not be doing it, well, there could be a couple reasons. One of them is you simply haven't been trained and taught how to do it. And so with that, you, you might need to learn a bit more about how to discern the voice of God. There is this other thing, Jeremiah, which we were just reading, uh, 31 and 34 says, For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. Sin and iniquity can block your ability to hear God. Sin can be sin that you did unwittingly, not knowing that it was wrong. I mean, your conscience might have been warning you, but you had no particular verse in mind that objectively said, don't go there. So you might have sinned unwittingly. You may have sinned knowingly. David did this when he committed adultery with Bathsheba, and then had her husband murdered, so he committed, he broke two of the Ten Commandments right there. So that can do it. Um, and then there's also this matter of iniquity, stuff that's generational, and I have separate teaching on that. I don't really want to dwell on it, but I'm just saying that can, that can also be a hindrance. And then the only other thing that's left is you've been taught and you have some kind of uh, cessationist spirit or spirit of false teaching on you that has somehow convinced you that this is not a possibility for you. That's it. Those are the only reasons. You didn't know that it was even possible. There's sin blocking it or you've been taught against it. So just run the traps on that. Which one do I have and then let's take care of it. And with that, we can, we can start entering into this life whereby God speaks to us. And as you go from faith to faith, as you go from one exploit to the next, as you have one success after another, you will find that your faith rises and increases. Smith Wigglesworth wrote a book called Ever Increasing Faith, and it really is about this exact issue, from victory unto victory, from glory to glory. A lot of Christians don't really think about that, but you know I've, I've mentioned this verse before in this pulpit, in this building in the past. In John chapter 5, verse 20, Jesus says to his disciples, I am going to do even greater works than I'm doing right now in order that you may marvel. Jesus Christ himself had an expectation that he would go from one level of breakthrough, and I'm going to substitute the word miracles here, 
to the next level of miracles to the next in order that he would wow his disciples. But it was because Jesus said, my father shows me everything he is doing because I follow what he shows me. And we have been taught by precept and example in America today to be willfully disobedient to the things of God. And it's in the air, it's in the water, and that's why we don't function in these dimensions. Everywhere I go, people are like, what do we got to do to get a breakthrough? I'm like, how about abandon your unbelief? How about your abandon your rebellion? And I'm not saying it to be, you know, like a hard-nosed, you wicked sinner, you. I'm not trying to do that, but I am actually trying to put my finger on something that has become endemic in our land and in our time. So faith begets faith, and unbelief begets unbelief. In fact, here's another truth, or a fact, truth that is unheeded breeds unbelief. When God puts truth in your heart and you don't listen to it, it will actually harden your heart and breed unbelief. This, by the way, is why we see an accelerating rush towards godlessness and lawlessness in our society right now because we are actively turning away from revelatory knowledge that God himself has placed in our culture and saying, no God, we don't want anything to do with that. And so God, as it says in 1 Thessalonians, abundantly, sorry, sorry, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, therefore God gives them over. God's like, fine, have it your way. And the train goes off the cliff. Well, we can't entirely stop what's going on in our society. We can work to change that. But we can take control of ourselves and choose to embrace truth and life and walk in that. And when we do, great breakthroughs happen. So that's the substrate. That's the gift of faith. That's how it works. That's how we trigger it. Now let's talk about the gift of miracles. So gifts of miracles or the effecting of miracles are events in which people and things are visibly, and I might say beneficially, affected in an extraordinary way by the power of God working through an individual. The word for miracles is the word dunamis. It's the word we commonly translate power. Um, the word dynamite comes from it. But, you know, in Hebrews 6.4, it says that we have tasted of the dunamis, which is the plural form of it, of the coming age. We have tasted of the miraculous powers of the coming age through the coming of the Holy Spirit. But we might say, well, why do we not see more of it? And again, it has this thing of are we leaning into it? Are we cooperating with it? Or are we shutting it down? So when we talk about the effecting of miracles, this is also a gift that's listed in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 6. And so the word, the word um, that's translated miracles is the capacity for a person to carry out an event and it demote, denotes a spontaneous expression of that manifest visible power of God. Now the most obvious and oft repeated miracle in the New Testament is the raising of Jesus from the dead. That was a miracle. It's contrary to the normal course of nature. Dead things don't come back to life. And yet 1 Corinthians 6.14 says that God's miraculous power was demonstrated in raising Jesus from the dead. And Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 15, 43 and 44, that Jesus was raised in miraculous power, in the dunamis of God, and he was raised in a spiritual body. And so Jesus becomes the firstborn from the dead in a new kind of body that can never die. And there are multiple examples of miracles of the type that I'm describing in Scripture. And I don't merely mean resurrections. I just mean things that run contrary to what we would typically understand from, we could say, the laws of nature or the laws of physics. Um, but, but any or all of these could be on exhibit, and, and there are, as I say, many examples of this um, in uh, Second Kings. I mentioned this one, but I'm going to read it now rather than just mentioning it because there's power in the Word of God itself. Hezekiah said to Isaiah, "What shall be the sign that the Lord will heal me, and that I shall go up to the house of the Lord on the third day?" I forgot to mention that Isaiah had said, "You'll be raised up by the third day." 
And Isaiah said, this shall be the sign to you from the Lord that the Lord will do the thing that he has promised. Shall the shadow go forward ten steps or go back ten steps? And Hezekiah answered, it's an easy thing for the shadow to lengthen ten steps. Rather, let the shadow go back ten steps. And Isaiah the prophet called to the Lord, and he brought the shadow back ten steps by which it had gone down on the steps of Ahaz. So there's a healing and a faith dynamic and a miracle here. The healing isn't what I'm focusing on, but Hezekiah does get healed. It's the miracle that is triggered by this calling on the Lord through the gift of faith. That's the one that I'm really focusing on. And we can see that, again, this is a miracle, in this case, over nature. Now, there are all kinds of miracles. Um, I'm going to talk about a couple of them, but I want to look at a, just a few examples here from the pages of the Bible. So in Mark chapter 4, we have another one. And, of course, this would be one from the ministry of Jesus. So it says in Mark 4, verse 35, On that day when evening had come, he said to them, Let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat just as he was. I think just as he was means that pretty much they just snatched him and ran. Probably because there was such a crowd that he wasn't going to be able to get out of there in any sort of dignified way. It's almost like somebody grabbed him and threw him over their shoulder. And other boats were with him, and a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling with water. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Well, there it is. He's expecting them to do something about it, but the fear in them shut down the faith. So if faith is confidence, fear is antithetical to confidence. So here's another insight that one of the things that will shut down the gift of faith in you is you live in fear. You could live in fear of things that are valid that have happened to you in the past. You could live in the fear of the great unknown. I had a friend when I was in college and I, I didn't really get what was going on with him. He, he'd been raised in a Catholic background, Catholic family. And one summer he came home with me to live with my mom and me because he couldn't, couldn't go back to Jamaica where he was from with, and still re-enter the United States. So he, he, had a, he had a visa, but he, it wasn't an in-and-out visa. So he was going to be in the U.S. over the summer. So he rode with me across the United States. We drove from New Jersey to California. Uh, and so we had some adventures along the way. But it was really interesting because as we were driving, you know, across the country, of course, you spend a lot of time talking about everything. And one of the things that I noticed about this guy, and it might have been a function of the way he was raised. I mean, he might have actually had trauma, but I didn't really have language for all that in those days, so I, I wouldn't have even known really what to do with it. But the one thing I noticed about this guy was over and over again, he would say, what if? What if? What if we get a flat tire out here? What if we run out of gas? What if we blow a hose? What if the truck, I had a pickup truck with a you know, camper shell in the back. What happens if the truck veers off the road? What happens if somebody head on comes at us from the other side of the interstate highway? What happens if we get into town and some guy jumps us or we get mugged? What happens, what if, what if, what if, what if? And finally, I just had enough. I mean, I was just provoked in my spirit. He's my friend, but I'm like, would you shut up with what if? But you know, some people live their whole lives with that. And if you live with that constantly, then you are with your own, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You are proving by your lips that you actually don't believe that your father is going to care for you. So if you're in fear, I mean, I'm not here to condemn you, but I am here to diagnose. It's time to get rid of that because that's going to stop this life of faith and miracles that we talk about. Here's a couple of others. We won't turn to these, but I'll just mention them. Elijah goes and seeks out King Ahab. He says, at my word, there will be neither rain nor dew these years. Then he vanishes. Now, how in the world can you make a statement like that? Well, the same way if you were in the afternoon session that you can say, my mother's dying tomorrow. Or there's going to be an earthquake when I arrive and another one when I leave, referring to the Paul Cain stories. That's how it works. Those were genuine, valid miracles, 
but they were triggered by the word of the Lord, which was received in faith. But if you're living in, well, it may not work, by definition, you're not in faith, so you're never going to move in miracles. Does that make sense? So somehow we've got to get to the place where we, where we can live in faith, but let me be clear again, this is not something we gin up by, you know, confessing unto possessing. This is something where the Spirit of God engenders something within us. It's the pollen dropping into the pistil, and suddenly something is birthed, and out of that, it gives rise. That's how Paul Cain called for earthquakes in advance. Acts chapter 5, verse 12. Now this is more of a healing one, but it still applies. It says that, Acts chapter 5, verse 12, I should probably read it, it's just one verse. But I do have to turn my pages to there. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. And none of the rest dared join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. Why did they want Peter's shadow to fall on them? Because they would get healed. And so that's a miraculous kind of healing. There's no laying on of hands. There's no spit. It's not as maybe impressive as healing at distance. But you know, if you could walk down the street with your shadow falling on all these sick people and just because of the sun being over here and your shadow falling there, what that means is you know, you're close enough to the sun that you're creating an after effect and boom, 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 boom. If people are getting healed, that's, that's going to be in the realm of the miraculous. Stephen, it says, was working great miracles among the people before he got stoned. And Philip did the same thing in Samaria. So we have at least these examples from the life of the ancient church that they were learning to walk in these things. And then in Acts chapter 19, verse 11, and in verse 12 that follows it, speaking of the great Ephesian revival that Paul led, it says this, and God was doing extraordinary dunamis acts of power by the hands of Paul so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick. Their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. These are called extraordinary miracles. These are miracles beyond mere miracles. They happen to be miracles of healing, but they are still miracles. And Paul says, so from Jerusalem clear around to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel in the power of of signs and wonders. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12, 12, were not the marks of a true apostle wrought among you with perseverance and with miracles? Not only healings, miracles. And Galatians 3, 5, lest you think it's all about Paul, Galatians 3, 5, Paul writes to the Galatian Christians in a church or series of churches that he had planted in Galatia, and he says, does God still work miracles among you? Which implies that this is beyond mere healing. You know, I think a lot of people are like, man, if we could just get somebody healed of a head cold, that would be good. But I'm saying I want to press beyond that. I want to go into the realm of things that defy science, that defy nature, where we are living in that powers of the coming age under an open heaven because we've prayed, let your kingdom come, let your will be done here on the earth as it is in heaven. We're living in that, and there is a continuous release and flow of these things. Many of the stories I was telling you this morning were about miraculous things that happened, not so much healing things that happened. And again, I'm all for healing. I'm not in any way trying to exclude it. I'm just saying most of us can't even get our head wrapped around the idea of miracles and I'm saying, can we leave the elementary teachings and go on to something else? Greater even than healing. Because you know, there's, a, there's like a progression, right? We've got, I think the kind of first level of breakthrough is just people are starting to maybe be receptive in here. 
But at the second level, we start to get healings, and those healings confirm the gospel that's preached. Jesus used healing heavily, but Jesus did more than healing. He turned water into wine in Cana. He walked on water. He rebuked wind and waves. He multiplied loaves and fishes. So above healing is miracles. And then we see Paul doing something called extraordinary miracles. I call that level four breakthrough. And most of us are happy to operate at level 0 0.5. Which is kind of half the healings works half the time. But I don't want that. I mean, I, I'll take it, but I'm not satisfied there. I want to be like Jesus in John 5.20. I'm going to do greater works than these so that you may marvel. And I want God to do that with all of us. And I think that's what God wants to do. I think that's the meaning of the 418 release that I taught about this morning. I think that's exactly the meaning of it. God wants to take us higher. And if we can align prophetic intercession Worship and compassion, and we get that thing going, we will move from point five to healing to miracles. There's extraordinary miracles, and when we go beyond extraordinary miracles, now we are talking about blitzkrieg. We are talking about breakout. We are talking about a power that cannot be stopped. And here's what it says. It says that because of this level of breakthrough in the miraculous, Acts 19 and verse 20, so the word of the Lord continued to increase. At minimum, that means this, and it might mean this. And to prevail mightily. The word of the Lord prevailed over the demonic powers that were in Ephesus and in Asia Minor. The word of the Lord prevailed over Artemis, the ruling spirit of Ephesus, and the Greek gods. And if you ever read a book called Converting Rome, there's a man who, who researched this. He said the main thing that brought the power of God, the kingdom of God, and the conversion of Rome to happen was the healings and the miracles, so much so that when Paul finished his tour, he... he took extra biblical accounts, this isn't in the Bible, but he looked at secular history and it was reported by the historians of the day that when Paul was done in Asia Minor, there were no sick people left to be found. That's prevailing mightily. This is a spiritual blitzkrieg. It is absolutely causing the enemy's front line to collapse and crumble and break. And I think that's what God wants to release in the modern church. But we've got to get ourselves aligned so we can function in that. That's what we want. And I will say, as I have said elsewhere, anything less than that isn't that. And we're not there yet. So where do we expect to see faith and miracles released? Well, anytime there's sick people who need to be healed. Now we're back to touching on healing. But to confirm the gospel where it's being preached, new areas are being evangelized. Or I might even say to show down the false prophets of our day, like Elijah calling down fire from heaven. How would you like to go up on Capitol Hill and face down Nancy Pelosi? Did I just say that? <laughs> yeah, freedom! <laughs> I hear William Wallace. Okay, these gifts are used to confirm God's will. To make it clear, I'll give you an example of this. One time I was traveling in Australia and I showed up in this town. It wasn't a very big town. No one in this room, unless you're Australian, would ever even know about it. It was on the southern coast, down on the southern ocean. This is an ocean that nobody ever thinks about. We always say the seven seas but no one can ever name them. They go North Atlantic, South Atlantic, North and South Pacific, Indian Ocean, eh. What are the other ones? So the Southern Ocean is between the southern coast of Australia and Antarctica. So I'm down on the southern coast of Australia on the Southern Ocean, and I, I roll into this town, and the pastor picks me up at the airport, and while we're driving in from this little, well, airport was a generous term. It was a Quonset hut with an airstrip. But... But we're going into town, and, and he goes, hey, uh, I was wondering if you're willing to meet with I leaders. I said, sure, uh, what are we going to meet about? He says, well, um, 
A while back, we, we, somebody in the church uh, heard this teaching that we can't really be a true New Testament church unless we're aligned with an apostle. And, you know, all you military people would understand this, and suddenly I'm like, mm, alert condition yellow, uh, general quarters, <laughs> just in case, right? So I'm like, I don't like the sound of this at all. I said, so what happened? He goes, well, so we went and found one. I'm like, forget yellow, we're going to red alert now. Captains to your planes, incoming enemy aircraft, scramble them. So, you know, we're driving in a town. I said, so what happened with that? He goes, well, so, you know, we, we aligned with the apostle, and uh, in the last year, we paid him more than $90,000. I said, well, okay, that might be a, you know, a, that's actually not far off the mark for a pastor in Australia. Yeah, they get, Australia's a wealthy country. So I, I said, okay, uh, okay. So he, he continues on and he says, but the thing is, because we're paying him, I had to take a job in town. So I work two days a week at the church and I work three days a week in town in order to pay my bills. And I, and I stopped and I said, Lord, is this man doing this because he's like embittered and ambitious? Or is, is this just a data point to say that the church is being drained of resources. And I, I kind of waited on the Lord a moment. And I knew this guy a bit, and I kind of looked at him, and I thought, no, this is an Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. So I thought, okay. He said, so what happened? He goes, well, so we sent out the apostle, and, and so he went off on his journeys to do his apostle thing. He didn't say it that way. That's my way of saying it. And I said, um, and what happened? He goes, well, as near as we can tell, there's no fruit. I said, what do you mean? He goes, well, there, there's nothing that, there's no benefit from it. I said, so has anyone been converted? No. Any churches been planted? No. Any healings? No. Any miracles? No. I said, so why are you guys still backing him? Well, half of my leadership team wants to back him, and the other half doesn't, and our church is on the verge of a split. And right then I'm thinking, Jesus, can I please go back to mergers and acquisitions? It was so much easier negotiating deals than having to deal with this kind of stuff. And why am I even here? But, you know, the last plane had gone, and if you didn't catch it, I'm in this little podunk town where I mean, there was no getting out of this. So we, we rock up to the church, and I had a small team with me. So we walk into the meeting, and, you know, they're all squabbling about this thing, and so somehow I'm supposed to be the mediator of this. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. And I could hear Father McCabe saying, Jesus married Joseph and all the saints. And I thought, I don't need Mary or Joseph or the saints, but I need Jesus. And I'm like, Lord, would you please help me with this? So, anyway, they're going on and on, and I said, listen, why don't we let the Holy Spirit sort this out? That was a word of wisdom. And they all kind of stop, and they look at me, and they go, well, how's that going to happen? And I said, everybody stand up. So they all stand up. And I'm like, God, you better back this. <laughs> but the word of the Lord came to me. So faith gets miracles. I said, in the name of Jesus, I command the spirit of false apostleship to come out. Every single elder aligned with that guy hits the ground, hissing and manifesting demons. <laughs> like that. So the team, they're like dogs on raw meat. <laughs> right? So we, we get after that and we drive all the demons out. And then, uh, you know, kind of <laughs> people are sort of coming to after all that. And I kind of went, well, that'll about solve the apostle question. Next order of business. Now, I tell the story. It's funny, but it really did happen that way. But I just said that one of the places we would expect to see this kind of faith and, and miracles in evidence is when we need to confirm God's will, often in dramatic ways. Can you imagine trying to solve church discipline problems in America that way? Some of you are laughing, but that's because you know that there's so much unbelief in the American church, this would never happen. But isn't this just like Elijah and the prophets of Baal? It's a slightly different context, and there was no pillar of fire that you know, came down and licked up the rocks, I grant you that. But, it, but it's still an, an example of that kind of thing. 
It also happens where an attestation to the truth of what is proclaimed is necessary. Now, we're coming into a time in our culture where, you know, we are going to see more and more, I would say, high-profile showdowns, figuratively speaking, figuratively speaking, just in case someone out in the blogosphere hears this, there'll be gunfights at the OK Corral, figuratively speaking, where two sides are in opposition and we're proclaiming the truth of the gospel and we're like, we're not going to back up on this. This is the word of the Lord and you're wrong and God will back the act. But you know, John Wimber used to say, faith is spelled R-I-S-K. So one of the ways that the gift of faith will, will happen is it will push you into that lack of comfort zone or the uncomfort zone, or the discomfort zone, say it the way you want, but the gift of faith will push you there, and inside you'll be going, no, I don't want to be doing this, oh God, I hope you show up. But if you're, if you're listening to him and being led by him, even though inside you're going, no, 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 God, God's never let me down. Not in one of those. It doesn't feel good in the moment, but afterward I'm like, yes, awesome! And so you immediately go from the one to the other. So how does the gift of faith come? Well, as I said, this is not something where if you quote the right 19 verses to the Lord, you will somehow twist his arm into it. This is a relational dynamic with God whereby you've learned to hear his voice and he gives you what you need because that's what he does. And if that's not your operative assumption that when I'm, in, when I'm up against the wall and I have a need, God will back it. If that's not your operative assumption, you're automatically back there at the front end of this message and you need to go review those points. But let's assume you've, you've kind of moved into the, the faith place where you know, things are starting to happen around you like this. The gift of faith can come in a passive form. When this happens, it's uh, in prayer. It could happen in contemplation. We might say meditation on the scripture or the truths of God or the person of God. And it would include assignments, things to do, where you're supposed to you know, go out and meet people or something he wants you to, a ministry he might want you to launch or whatever. I mean, it could be many different things, but this is something that happens kind of, we should say, away from people in your prayer closet, quiet times, whatever, that. Then there's an active form. This is a gift that occurs in unpredictable times, like my story of this elder team in this little town in Australia. But it will typically occur when you have a sudden discernment and realize what the enemy's plan is in a situation and you want to flip the tables on that thing. Or maybe more accurately, God wants to flip the tables and you are his vessel for doing it. And so, whereas the first one may have a, like a longer term kind of fuse to it, you pray over something for maybe days or weeks or months and, you know, in, over time starts to come to you and then you act out on that in this second one the active form you're in the moment and not unlike a word of knowledge or something else it, it comes to you or as the bible itself says the word of the lord comes to you and so you're now ready to wreak havoc on the enemy's plans in that situation the third way it can happen is when you see a pattern behind circumstances this could be circumstances in society could be circumstances in people's lives, um, but it's something that makes you know that something either is about to occur or it ought to occur, and you become the one who triggers that. That's what Elijah did on Mount Carmel. He goes up there and he's like, hey, let's have a barbecue. You guys bring one cow, I'll bring another one, um, and I want my altar to look like this. You guys, you do your thing. I'll let you go first. And so he's seen the pattern. He knows what the issue is. The issue here is that there is a drought in Israel, which he called for, but the drought is due to the disobedience of Ahab and the insidious influence of his wife Jezebel. No, I'm not teaching on Jezebel spirits. He simply sees this pattern of corruption, of immorality, of idolatry, and he understands that that is ultimately what's causing this drought because in Deuteronomy 28, it says, if you go after idolatry, drought will come upon your land. By the way, California is in a historic drought right now. Has been for a couple of years. I'll just leave it there. 
But I do note that our Vice President and Speaker of the House both come from California. Um, so you see the, and you suddenly understand what the pattern is, and you know that something has to occur, and so what does Elijah do? He says, let's have a barbecue, and he basically sets them up in order that in the end, 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah can be put to the sword to end the reign of idolatry in Israel. It's, it's kind of a gruesome, bloody story, I'll grant you, and it offends the modern mind, but under the Old Testament economy, the penalty for leading people away to worship other gods was death. Right there in Deuteronomy 13, you can read it for yourself. So Elijah was within scriptural boundaries under the laws of old Israel. Today you'd go to jail, but, but not in those days. Well, actually they threatened to kill him for doing it, so they didn't like having their religion torn down. But the point is not that all these people got slaughtered. The point is Elijah called down fire because he saw what it would take in order to separate true religion from the false religion that they were following. And so with that, you may be able to predict with accuracy the occurrence of an event in the future. You may be able to call people out by name or address or whatever along the lines of what we discussed this morning. You might speak an event into existence right now uh, by the word of faith. You might rebuke a storm. You could multiply food. Most of those kinds of miracles, I've seen them at least once in my life. I'm not saying that to brag. I'm just saying I've seen them. And I'm, what I'm trying to give you tonight is the principles by which these things work so that you can start moving toward them too. Because I think we need these things. And so I'm grateful for every person who's sick who gets healed, but I want to move into the dimension of miracles as well and beyond that even into extraordinary miracles. And I think if we can get a whole church that's starting to flow that way, we might have a fighting chance. And I think if the 418 thing is really underway, and by the way, I got messages today from Chris Reed and Mike Bickle. Each of them had their own meetings today while we were holding ours, and the Lord was confirming that word as they were preaching it in manners. I mean, each of us functions somewhat differently, but nevertheless, all of us had our own testimonies, and we were sharing all that among ourselves of what happened. I really think the Rolling Thunder Review has come to town. Now let me ask you a question. I want you to be honest here. I gave you a diagnostic on the gift of faith and, on, and what kills it. How many of you have a problem with faith? So we have 10 honest people in the room. How many of you don't see many miracles in your life? Okay, I, there's more hands in the second question than the first one, and the two are correlated. So I just flushed out a few of you on question one by your answer to question two. I do too. I want more. I want to go higher. And I've shown you that it's scripturally right to expect that there would be more. Not only did Jesus expect it, Paul had it. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. So if we're not there, again, the problem's not up there. It's down here somehow. Right now I'm feeling like Elijah on Mount Carmel. Yeah. We need fire. I'm going to say something that Elijah said. This just came to me. I didn't plan this. It's not in my notes. How long will you halt between two opinions? The Lord be God, follow him. Baal. Witchcraft, the unclean teachings of our modern world, atheism, agnosticism, scientism, if they be God, follow them. If you want to get rid of that unfaith thing, to think for a minute about the various things that I was talking about that kill faith, that stop the flow of the gift of faith, by extension, stop the life of miracles. If you want that to stop in you, 
I want you to come up to the front and we're going to have a general prayer of confession of our specific issues. And we're going to call down the fire. Fire! Now, I gave different things that are, well, we've got almost the whole room up here. Okay. Is my prayer team getting prayer or praying? I love this guy. He's my brother from another mudder. <laughs> the Lord sent him along, and he's a real gift to me. I really do. I love this guy. And I love these two also, sisters in the Lord. They've traveled with me, usually together, to lots of places in the world. All right, so here's what we're going to do. I'm going to lead you in a prayer. I gave you a lot of things that could be your barrier. When we get to that appropriate point, I'm just gonna shut up and I want you to say aloud what you're thinking. You don't have to shout it, but I do want it articulated aloud. I don't want any of this praying in your head. I don't want your lips moving, but no words coming out of them. You need to speak it aloud. There's something about the spoken word that breaks the yoke of these things in your life. And then we're going to ask the Lord to release something upon you so that faith, the gift of faith begins flowing through you and that it becomes the catalyst or the detonator for the miraculous in your life. Does that sound good? Yeah. You have something wrong with your heart. You do. This goes right, you're going to get healed. Right now. Tonight. In the next couple of minutes. All right, are you ready? Let's pray. Father, we come in Jesus' name. And I just thank you for this group of people. I thank you that they are fired up. I thank you that they are filled with faith. Lord, I thank you for this message which you gave to me for this night. I thank you that you say in your word, open wide your mouth and I will fill it. And when we do, you fill it. I thank you that your word never falls to the ground. You say that when you stand before kings and emperors, and governors, I will give you what to say in that hour. There are some of you here that don't believe God would actually fill your mouth in the moment. You've never been in the role, so you've never had the need. But you've stumbled through unbelief in even that basic statement. So let's start with that one. Lord, forgive me for believing that you would not fill my mouth. Lord, I offer my mouth to you. My tongue, my lips, my vocal cords. Fill my mouth. Lord, I come to you and I confess these things that I realize have held me back from true and authentic faith. Now speak it aloud. Speak it aloud. It's not very loud in here. We got 200 people. If you're all even speaking at a normal voice, it should be loud.
Lord, forgive me for the times I've turned back when I knew the way I should go. And forgive me for the times I have questioned you. I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Here's my unbelief, Lord, take it, give it to him in your hands. When the apostle Paul was preaching in Ephesus, they brought their scrolls and they lit a bonfire and they burned those scrolls. We are, we are going to ask the Lord to burn this unbelief up. Whatever part of it you can find in yourself, I want you to throw it up here on the stage. I know there's nothing literal you're throwing up here, but I want you to make it as though you had a scroll, something you pulled out of your mind, something you pulled out of your heart, a specific action where you failed to follow God, a specific thing you confessed with your mouth that was wrong, some sort of a statement that betrayed what was in your heart that was wrong. I want you to throw all of it up here. Father, we want you to light a bonfire tonight that you burn this stuff up, that it can't even be recovered. That instead, the people of God begin to walk in a new and refined faith. The scripture says that God will give us a faith that is refined in the fire. Refined in the fire refined in the fire. This woman who came here from Kansas City, the Lord was on you this morning. The Spirit of God is granting you an impartation of faith. This is not something you've had a lot of teaching on this way. Not the way I taught it tonight, but God is making you into that kind of a woman right now. Let that come upon you in the name of Jesus. Here it comes. Here it comes. Here it comes. Honor, Lord. Honor now. Yes, take her, Lord, take her. Take her in Jesus' name. Put your hand on her, Mikhail. Lord, we call in the fire on our sister. We call in the fire on our sister. Light her up, Lord. Let the fire burn. Right here in the front, the Spirit of God is moving. Take that, take that in Jesus' name. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, more, more on Marianne, more on Marianne. I break the power of the unbelief of the medical profession and all that has been clinging to you. Yeah, from what's in the hospital, everything that has held you back. Lord, let her, let her burn with fire again in Jesus' name. Take more, Chris, take more. For those of you who are, I just got this, for those of you that are wondering, faith and miracles are like tongues and interpretation. You can't have one without the other. That's what we're asking you for. supposed to be living in that realm. 